Thank you so much, Megan. My name is Aaron, and uh, I had the privilege to be a part of last year's triathlon. No records were set. I actually, I wanted this year the name of it to be Our Fat for Their Freedom. <laughs> but everybody felt that was really inappropriate. <laughs> so we're going to be doing it again. I'll be wearing Our Fat for Their Freedom t-shirts if you want to. They'll be available in the lobby after the services. Only extra large sizes available. Shrink to fit. Well, I'm grateful today to be able to launch our new series. Uh, as we have finished up over the last uh, couple months, we did a series of ancient words, and now we're moving into a series home, blessed to be a blessing. And over the next week today and over the next four weeks, we're going to be laying out a framework and seeing how we are called to be a place and a people that creates home, not just for ourselves, but that we are blessed in that so that we may be a blessing. And I've been given the task today to attempt to launch us into a biblical framework, a foundation in how we understand from God's perspective what home is. Because for many of us, as you say the word home, for some people it's going, oh, that's so wonderful. For others, there is no place on earth I would rather not be than home. Because maybe your experience has been one that it hasn't been a positive place. But what we want to do is allow God to step in and to redeem that idea of home for us to be a place and a people that houses presence and that are blessed to be a blessing. So before I launch in, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, you are here. And Lord, I ask that you do all you want to do. I'm going to ask you to give me some energy and focus. And I'll stay and say the words you want to say. And Lord, I pray for my friends that the things that are of you will stick and the things that are not will fade away. In the precious name of Jesus, our Messiah, amen. As I begin, I have a confession to make. I'm 100% excited to be doing this and 100% exhausted because yesterday, Joe Antis, one of our other worship pastors, got married. Uh, which is, everybody get, praise the Lord for Joe getting married. <laughs> Blessings on Quinn. That's his wife. <laughs> but you know what I found at 42? I'm not able to party late into the night like I used to. I used to be able to bounce back. Now I more crawl back. <laughs> but I had complete supervision throughout the evening. The Carlucci family and my daughter Grace supervised me the whole night. So I am holy and blameless this morning to be able to present the word. <laughs> I want to get a running start in what we're going to be talking about today. And I want to begin in Genesis chapter 1, the very, very beginning. And in the beginning, it said that God created the heavens and the earth. And it says that it was formless and void, and there was darkness over the deep. Some theologians call this that it was chaos. There was chaos. There was nothing. There was no order. And God begins to step in as the Spirit of God is hovering over the deep. And he speaks, and there is light, and there is life. And then in that place, he begins, from that moment, he begins to create and he separates the light from darkness. And he separates the, the sky from the sea. And he separates the sea from the land. And you know the story goes on and on. And the whole time he's expanding and he is creating home. He's creating this magnificent extension of himself that is, that is for, um, for his glory and the good of his creation. And as he goes on, as final act, he, he creates man and he creates woman and they're to be in his image and they're put in this perfect paradise. And in this paradise, they are, um, they, they are belonging to him and they belong to each other. And in this paradise, they have an inheritance through him of everything they could possibly need. And in this place, they have an identity that is firm, that they know who they are. There is no question. And in this place, they understand that there is purpose. And for two chapters, things are going amazing. And then we move into chapter three. It's a quick read. As we move into chapter three, there's a bit of a breakdown. We see that... Uh, 
as, as many of you know the story, we see that the serpent speaks to Eve and she is deceived in that way and she talks to Adam and Adam and Eve decide to do the only thing God said not to do. He said, there's only one thing I don't want you to do. It sounds like me as a child. There's only one thing I don't want you to do. That would be the very thing that I'm going to do. And they take from the fruit of the tree the knowledge of good and evil. And we see that from that, there is a fracture in the relationship between God and humanity. There's a fracture in the relationship between Adam and Eve and a fraction of the relationship between humanity and the rest of creation. And we see they actually leave that perfect home, that perfect paradise. And they have to head out. Well, as chapter 3 rolls and we move in, we see that things are you know, they get from kind of not great to somewhat worse. There's violence that's introduced. And it culminates in chapter 6 where God says and he looks and he sees that there is wickedness all over the earth. So much so that man only does what he wants and there is wickedness in his thoughts of his heart at all times. And so there is the flood. Once again, there is chaos. After the flood subsides and God has found favor with Noah... And he's in his boat, and the waters subside, begins again, and they're moving, and God is in relationship with humanity. But humanity continues to move away from God further and further. And finally, in Genesis chapter 11, we come to the story of the Tower of Babel. It says that all of creation, all of humanity had one language. And they said to themselves, you know what? I think this is what we should do. We should build a city, and we'll put a tower in the middle of this city, and it's going to go all the way to heaven. So anytime we want to deal with God, we can go up there and meet with him. And it says that they, tr they did this to make themselves a great name. God was not pleased with this. And so we see that God says, I'm going to confuse them. I'm going to bring chaos upon them. And he divides them up that from one moment everybody's speaking the same language, Fifteen minutes later, there is the introduction of all kinds of new languages. It'd be like something goes wrong here where I'm like, hey, why don't we build a tower in this room? And God says, that's not a good idea. And that every single row would have a different language. Could you imagine the parking lot after the service? I don't understand what you're saying. But there is chaos and there is division. And we see this movement of God's initiation and creation, and then we see chaos, disorder, confusion. God's initiation and, cre and creation, disorder, and confusion. And as we move from chapter 11 in Genesis to chapter 12, something amazing is about to happen. It's something absolutely amazing, and it's absolutely brilliant, and it's subtle. God's dis answer to the chaos of what had happened at the Tower of Babel was to create bait, home, a house. In the Hebrew, the word bait is home or house. And just like I didn't get to preach in the Ancient Word series, so I decided to bring it into this one. I'm not allowed to speak Hebrew in public, but I said, Brian and Jean are here, so I'm going to give it a shot. So as we move into this, we see that this word is so profound and so big because it means more than just a structure or a building. It means a people, a family. Actually, at the root of the word, it means a container, a receptacle. And so what this idea is, it is a people, it is a place, it is a family that are to house the presence of God. And that they are to be the conduit, the receptacle, the container of the presence of God in the world. And so instead of the people building up a great name for themselves, what God says is, I'm going to move in and I'm going to create a house, a home. And I'm going to re-engage with humanity in a new way. Let's drop into the story. I love the fact that in Genesis chapter 12, the story that sets the so many things in motion, is so abbreviated. Out of the middle of nowhere, the Almighty who was and is and is to come shows up to a guy named Abram. Now, Abram was the son of Terah. Terah was a man, and his family was from Ur, and he gathered up for those of you who remember this old show, like the Clampets, he gathered up his family and was heading off to a new land. Nobody knows that story. Amazing. 
don't use joke at the 6.30 service. It's actually at 5.30. But he gathers up his family in Ur, and he says, we're going to Canaan. But on the way, he never makes it to Canaan with his family. He stops in Haran, and there they live. And Abram would grow up as a foreigner in a foreign land. It's similar to Colorado. If you are not born in Colorado as a native, you can live here 107 years, but they will not accept you as a native to Colorado. And if you are for California, oh, forget it. But we're going to out, we're going to be more of us than you for pretty soon. So anyways. But as we go, Abram is a man that is a foreigner in a foreign land. He will always be looked at as an alien to this place. And to top it off, he and his wife cannot have children. And so he is a foreigner in a foreign land, and he has no hope of a future. And oftentimes, the riches of a family was looked at by the number of children you had. And so Abram's reputation wasn't that great. And out of the midst of this, God looks down and he says, you know, we got a lot of chaos going on here. Who shall I use? You know, and who has the best social media profile? Who's one of the ones that's, you know, just an innovator in his field? He doesn't do any of that. He looks down and he chooses a man who is a foreigner in a foreign land who doesn't have a future and says, I like that one. And he speaks to Abram and he says, Abram, now, could you imagine going to work one day just like normal? Just, you're at work. You're doing whatever you're doing. And all of a sudden, the voice of the Almighty who has not spoken in a long time, and the last time he did speak, he was ticked off at a bunch of people for building a tower. And he begins to speak to you. And he says to Abram, Abram, if you leave the land that you're in of your father's household and you go to the land that I'm going to show you, I am going to make you a great nation. And I am going to bless you. And I'm going to make your name great. And I am going to make you a blessing in which all families from now forever in all the earth will be blessed. I love Abram's response. That sounds good. Let's do that. <laughs> Things around here don't look like they're going anywhere fast. But what I love is could you imagine the conversation between Abram and Sarai as he goes to his wife? Hey, honey, you'll never imagine what happened today at work. God spoke to me. Which one? The one. I love the fact that that conversation, as Sarah, I look at Abraham and say, is this one of your get rich quick schemes again? Because I don't know. The last couple things haven't worked out very well. But Sarah trusts him. And she says, where are we going? He's like, I don't know. He'll show us. Well, what's going to happen? Not so sure. Okay. Let's do it. And so they gather up all their people and they begin to head out. But what God is doing in this situation with two very unlikely characters is he's beginning to lay, to pour the foundation by eat of a house, a home. And he lays this foundation. And this house, this home is going to be a people, not a building. And this people are going to be the ones who are the conduit, the container, the receptacle of the presence of God in the world. And what I want to do for the next few moments is I want us to look at this passage in Genesis chapter 12. Because I believe there are four things that God lays out as the framework for what the house is to look like. The people is to look like. Later on, he's, God's going to get into uh, construction and buildings, but right now, he's building a people. And there are four things that are at the foundation of this people. And the first thing that he says is, I will make you a great nation. You're going to belong to me. I'm going to belong to you. And you're going to belong to each other. A man who doesn't have a future. A man who's not able to do this on his own is now going to be the father of a great nation. And that nation will be marked by the presence of God. It's as if God is putting in the first cornerstone to say, here's what it is. The first cornerstone to building a house belong to me and belong to each other. And I'm the one that's going to do this. You 
Yesterday, as I said, uh, we had a wedding here. It was awesome. Natalie, you did an amazing job of coordinating everything. Thank you. John Stewart as well. Give a little shout outs. But as we had this wedding, it was interesting for me as I had been preparing for this sermon because in Aramaic, the word which is close to Hebrew, the word for spouse is bait. It's house. It's home. Because when two individuals covenant together, what they create is a container for love to grow, for relationship to be built. Now, husbands, never call your wife house. <laughs> Doesn't translate well. But one of the things in this is there is this commitment that in belonging to one another, we create a space that is home. Home for each other, home for the children, home for other people. And it was so fun to watch as we had the rehearsal dinner as Joe and all their, all their friends. It was, it was a millennial fest. It was just lots of millennials. And it was wonderful. As a Gen Xer, I was just like, oh, they're so cute. Just kidding. I'm just, I'm, I'm just, I'm just joking. They're wise and brilliant. But it was so exciting to watch because in the relationship between Joe and Quinn, as they came together, they created home for so many people in the relationships. A place where they belong to each other, they belong to God, and they belong to others. And this is what happened with Abram. Rabbi Philip uh, Grubart said these words. He said, the true lesson of Bayit, home, is not a physical space at all. It's subjective, spiritual concept, an emotional sp space, a set of commitments that defines me and makes me feel most at home. And so the foundation is not necessarily location, but is the commitment to one another. And so as, Abraham, as God speaks to Abraham, he is creating a home, and the first foundation is his commitment to say, I'm going to belong to you no matter what. And you're going to belong to me, and everybody around you is going to belong to each other. And so the first place of home is belonging. But God doesn't stop there. He says to him, he says, I am going to bless you. And the blessing of this is an inheritance. And in the Hebrew and the Greek culture, an inheritance, as oftentimes in our culture, is a free gift. You do nothing to get it other than belonging to the person that's going to give that to you. It's free. And what God is saying to Abraham is, you belong to me, you get my inheritance. My resources that are unending are now available to you. In chapter 15 of Genesis, Abraham's getting a little squirrely. He's like, I understand this belonging thing, but how's it going to happen? And God speaks to him and says, Abraham, your inheritance is my presence. And I am going to be your shield and your very great reward. And then he takes him outside of the tent and he shows him the stars. He says, you see those stars? I sure do. He says, that's how many people are going to be in the nation of your people. And God is promising there. And so in the inheritance, there is presence. Within that presence, and this could be a longer sermon that we could spend a, a, multiple days on, but I'm just going to move quickly through that. But in that presence, there is the protection. God says, I'll be your shield and I will be your very great reward. So within this, God is creating a house, a people that belong to him and belong to each other. He's creating a people that have an inheritance that is unending, unwavering, and it is firmer than anything that they've seen. That type of cash does not fade and lose its value. I love the song in the Rattle and Hum album by you, uh, that Bono sings in U2. He says, My God, the God that I serve is not short of cash unending, abundant inheritance. But he doesn't stop there. He speaks to Abraham and he says, I'm going to give you a great name. This is amazing to a guy that has kind of a, possibly a suspect reputation. Hey, do you know Abram? Oh, the guy from a foreign land and his wife's barren. Yeah, not, not, not the greatest thing to be known as. But some of the other characters in the Bible, it's interesting. Like, how would you like to be known through all history as the woman with the flow of blood or the woman caught with adultery, blind Barimaeus and Downing Thomas? So there's kind of some worse uh, nicknames you could have. But what is happening is God steps into Abram and he speaks into him and says, I'm going to make you a great name that you will know your identity and your identity will be firm. And it doesn't matter what you've done and it doesn't matter what is going to happen your identity will be the fact 
that you are chosen and called by God and that you belong to me. Because Abram's going to make a bunch of mistakes, doesn't he, coming up in this story, and we're not going to get into that. And God never says, nope, not my child anymore. He says, you're mine. You belong to me. Your identity is firm. It's solid. And so home is created once again. We have that he is given a nation to belong. He is given an inheritance. He is given an identity. And finally, God begins to speak to him, and he says, I want you to have a purpose And your purpose is every family in earth will be blessed through you. The purpose of Abram that God speaks to him and says, this isn't just for your own good. This is for all of humanity for all time. You will be blessed to be a blessing. Beyond your occupation, beyond your relationships, your purpose is to be a container of the presence of God to bless everyone you come in contact with. And so he lays again the foundation to belong, an inheritance, an identity, and now a purpose. And I love the fact that God chose the unlikely to do this, don't you? He chooses the unlikely to do this. And God steps into the chaos and the confusion of Abraham's life, into humanity's life, and he steps into that and he creates bayit. He creates home, and home is a people that house the presence of God. We fast forward the story and we see that in the life of Jesus, it isn't a saying, well, that was then and this is now. But we see that Jesus comes on scene, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. He is born and the promised prophecies become fulfilled. And what happens is, what was promised to Abraham, now the gates are flung wide open and says, this is not just for the heirs of Abraham, but this is for all nations, for everyone. Jesus is the gate. And it isn't to block people out. Jesus is the gate to welcome people in. And so the promises to Abraham of all those things, now he's saying, through my son Jesus, God is saying, I am creating home in the chaos of the world and welcome you all in. Look at this scene when Jesus is born. They go and they don't even have a proper place. It's a barn or, a, or, or whatever you want to call it. It's just, it's not even his. It's not like that's the place. The fact it was the people that were there. And Jesus comes on the scene and then look at the people that get invited in. You got angels and you got shepherds. And a couple months to a year later, you've got these guys that are supposed to be really smart from the east and they roll up on the scene and they start giving gifts. But you see that you have all nations and you have heaven and earth coming together as the gate is open wide and God is saying, I'm creating home to welcome all people in. And all people can belong and all people can receive this abundant inheritance and all people can have an identity and all people can jump into this purpose. Peter, in, a, in First Peter, he writes these things. He says this to the, to the early followers of Jesus. He says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices accepting to God through Jesus Christ. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into marvelous light. Check this out. He says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have God's mercy. Through Jesus, the gates are open. And all are welcomed in to the home, the place where they belong, to receive an inheritance, a solid identity, and a purpose that is beyond a paycheck, but it is to be a blessing to all individuals. I wonder today if we would allow God to move into the chaos and the confusion of the lives of times we live in. You know, 
you look at history and it's always a little bit rocky. There's always chaos. There's always confusion. And right now there is that in our world. But will we allow God to create home in the midst of the chaos that we are experiencing, that we have experienced, and that we would stand on that foundation? And for some of us that have had a home life as we were growing up or in right now, who say, you know what, this is chaos. Can it be, can, I hope it's not like this. It's not. Through Jesus, it can be the place in which God steps in and brings belonging and all those things that I said. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. And then we're going to turn the heat up a little bit more in here. It's getting a bit chilly. What I'd like to do is I'd like to move into a time of prayer. And I want to invite the Spirit of God to begin to do what only He can do. That we may be like Abram, Abraham, and allow God to step into the confusion of our lives and create all those things. But I have a little warning before we move on that just like Abram, it's not going to be easy. You read on the story of Abraham, he has some difficulties, some bumps along the way. He made some mistakes, and it was tough. You read the story of Abraham, another thing is it didn't come fast. It was over time that it was created. But just like Abram, I believe God promises to us that he will do it. And as the New Testament says, that he that began a good work in you will see it through to completion. So as Dan begins to play and before we move into communion, I want to pray. We bow your, bow your heads. In the place that you're at, would you invite the Holy Spirit into the confusion and the chaos of your life? Could it be that he is saying to you today, by name, he's saying, I want to create a home, a house in and through you. say, I want you to belong to me. I want you to belong to others and allow them to belong to you. Can you hear him say to you today, Receive my inheritance as a free gift. My protection, my provision. Can you hear him say to you today, stand firm who I say you are. 
in your identity. That you are chosen. That you are called. That you are loved. That you belong. And finally, can you hear him say, I'm not asking you to leave your job. I'm not asking you to go anywhere else. But will you receive my purpose for your life? And that is in everything you do and everywhere you go, you are a blessing of my presence, my power, my truth, and my love in the world. Will you say yes today to creating home? Pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. As we come, we have communion here. And what I ask is as we come up for you to take the, the bread and the cup and then just go back to your seat and we'll take it together as we worship and celebrate. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup of the new cup and he raised it. He said, this is my blood poured out for you. Every time you drink this, remember who I am and what I've done. And as we take it today, can we hear him call us home? And can we hear him call us to create home?